Hi everyone, um, I'm Marianne Talbot. Um, some of you know me and I know some of you, but not all of you. Uh, and I don't know anyone who's watching the podcast, so hello to everyone watching the podcast. Um, Okay, I'm going to, I've given six lecture titles for this series, but I'm going to be changing a few at the end. So you're going to get everything that you've signed up for, but you might get it a, in a different order or something. Um, but today we're going to look at these things. We're going to first of all look at why is causation important? Um, because when I've talked over the summer to people about the lectures I'm writing, I'm writing lectures on causation. Lots of people have said, what's causation? Why, you know, why is it important? So I think it's very important actually to have a look first at why we're bothering to think about causation. Um, then I'm going to look about how philosophers think about causation because there's a difference to the way philosophers think about causation to the way that scientists, for example, think about causation. And we'll have a little look at, at what that way is and why it's different. Um, then I'm going to look at Hume's regularity theory. And the reason I'm going to look at that is modern thinking about causation started with Hume. You cannot not start with Hume. I'm, well, you could. I mean, it, it, people like me who've been doing it for years think, oh, boring old Hume. But, but of course, Hume isn't boring. Hume is really, really interesting. Uh, and we are going to start with him uh, and his regularity theory. Um, and so I'm going to explain what the regularity theory is. Then I'm going to look at problems for the regularity theory. And I'm going to finish today with the canonical statement of RTC, the regularity theory. Um, because it's gone through many changes since Hume. Um, and I'll, I'll say which one those who adopt the regularity theory, and that's many, many philosophers still, um, which statement of it they would accept today. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, and I'm going to start with why is causation important? And I'm going to start off looking at why it's important for everyone, for everyone here. Uh, and what, then I'm going to look at why it's important in particular for philosophers. Um, so, for a start, nearly every explanation you offer of almost anything you're trying to explain is going to be a causal explanation. And there are philosophers, David Lewis, whom you'll be introduced to next week, uh, is someone who believes that all explanation is causal explanation because all explanation gives a, some information about the causal history of an event. OK, so um, if you're thinking, well, why did that happen? Um, you look for the cause of whatever that is. So if you're wondering about the explanation of B, if you can think that A causes B or all Bs are caused by A, then and there was an A a minute ago, then you've got your explanation of B. So explanations appeal to the relation of causation, the relation of between two events, and we'll look at whether that's whether they are indeed events later. Um, but the relation of causation is very important for the purposes of explanation. And human beings go in for explanation a lot. That's what we do, really. Um, also, you cannot really predict things without appealing to the causal relation. So if you know that A's cause B and you see the occurrence of an A, or you've got reason to believe whatever it is that an A is coming, um, then you'll have reason to predict a B. Because knowing that A and B are, are causally related enables you to predict a B on observation of an A. Um, so again, it, causation is, is vital for explanation. Causation is vital also for prediction. So we can predict things so well, for example, um, eclipses. I mean, I don't know about you, but I got up at three o'clock the other night and wrapped myself in a duvet and went and sat in the garden um, because they told me that there was going to be a lunar eclipse. And there was, <laughs> you know, amazing, isn't it? Um, but that's because we know about causal relations. So causation is essential to prediction in the same way that it's essential to explanation. Um, and then if we want to manipulate anything, if we know that A's cause B, um, if we bring about an A, we'll also bring about a B, won't we? So, so if we want to bring about a B, the way we can do it is to bring about an A. So we can manipulate the world 
in virtue of the fact that we know about causal relations. So causation is absolutely vital. Um, it really is. We'll say a bit more about that later. Um, for philosophers, causation is every bit as vital. Um, I mean, we have causal theories of knowledge. So if anyone of you know about the Gettier problems, um, the causal theory of knowledge is supposed to explain the Gettier problems. Now, I'd better explain that for those who don't know. Um, the Gettier problem says that the traditional theory of knowledge, according to which knowledge is justified true belief. Okay, so um, let's say Chris has a belief about me that I own a uh, Toyota Yaris. And he's justified in believing that because he's seen me driving around town in a Toyota Yaris. Okay, and what's more, I do own a Toyota Yaris. Um, nice little silvery green thing. Um, now, there's a problem with this because actually the Toyota that Chris has seen me driving around town in isn't mine, it belongs to Bob. And it's, it's a horrible red thing. Um, so the Toyota that makes true his belief that I own a Yaris and the Toyota that justifies his belief that I own a Yaris come apart, don't they? Um, does he know that I own a Yaris? Most people would say no, he doesn't. Because um, the, the conditions justifying his belief come apart from the conditions that make true his belief. How do we solve this? Well, we, we try and make a causal relationship between the conditions that make his belief true and the conditions that justify his belief. And so that's the causal theory of knowledge. We appeal to causation to explain what knowledge is. And we also explain to causation to appeal what content is. So how do I know what the content of your belief is? Could you um, entertain the concept of red unless a red object had caused you to have an experience of red at some time in your past, do you think? No. Okay, if you, if you think not, then there's the causal theory of content. Um, there's got to be causal relations involved in the identification of content of your beliefs and perceptions. And of course, the causal theory of perception. Um, Macbeth, uh, is this a dagger I see before me? Well, no, it wasn't, <laughs> um, because there was no dagger causing the experience he was having. He was having an experience as of a dagger, but there was no dagger in the causal history of that experience, and so he wasn't perceiving a dagger. So again, do you see that causation is absolutely fundamental to the idea of what it is that you're, cause, uh, what it is that you're perceiving? So um, David Hume uh, called causation the cement of the universe. Causation is the relation that holds together all the events in the universe. Every event has a cause, perhaps not the beginning of the universe itself, and the cause was God. Um, but, but otherwise, everything has a cause, is an effect, and it's the cement of the universe, says David Hume. Uh, and John Carroll, and, and you'll find all the references, by the way, you'll find on the uh, handouts that I've got here that I'm not handing out now because I don't want you to ha have all the answers to the questions I'm going to ask. But you can take the handout. So actually, you don't need to make co copious notes unless it helps you understand. Uh, it does me, so I understand if it does you. OK, so John Carroll says, with regard to our total conceptual apparatus, causation is the centre of the centre. You just would not understand anything if you didn't understand causation. The philosopher Kant thought causation was one of the concepts that we have innately. We're born with the concept of cause. Um, this is very boring. Keep the colour scheme and don't show this message again. That sounds right. But where's the cursor gone? Otherwise, if you turn the volume down, we can't actually see it on the screen, so... Where's the cursor gone? We yeah. extended the screen, so it was... Uh, so keep the... And don't show this message again. Okay, we'll give it one more chance. Jolly good. Right, 
I, I didn't realise you couldn't see it, but I, I, it was ob also obscuring what I could see on my screen. OK, so, so causation is the centre of the centre of our conceptual scheme. So let's go on to how do philosophers think about causation? Well, um, we want to know first what causation is. I mean, if you're going to ask, does something exist? Does God exist? You need to know what it is about whose um, existence you're, you're questioning. Um, so what is God? What, what is this thing that you're asking whether it exists or not? And the same thing is true of causation. Um, if we want to know whether causation exists and what it is, we need to know first what causation is. So we start by analysing the concept. And to analyse the concept is, is to, um, for example, we reason using the concept of causation. So we say if A causes B and an A occurred, we can follow on that by saying a B will occur. That's the prediction I was talking about earlier. So we look at how the, we reason with the concept of causation, what it entails, what we infer from it, and, and so on. Um, that's what it is to analyse a concept. Um, but then we want to know whether it exists, so we turn to metaphysics. So is there anything that satisfies this role, the role that something plays in our reasoning? Um, so if God is omnipotent, omniscient, and... Um, omnipresent, have I got that right? Um, then we want to know whether there is anything that satisfies those three things. And if we think that the problem of evil shows that, that it's a contradiction that anything could satisfy those things, we're going to conclude that God doesn't exist. And it's the same with causation. Um, we, we will look at its role in reasoning and then we'll ask whether it exists. So we are interested in the nature of causation, of causation itself, but we start by looking at the concept of causation, the way it, we work with causation in our reasoning. Um, so let's have a, have a little go at that. OK, so imagine my tomato plants have died. They look terrible, don't they? Um, and if the Queen had watered my tomato plants, they would not have died. I mean, this is true. Um, well, the Queen's not watering my tomato plants, therefore caused them to die. Did it not? And here's the queen failing to water my tomato plants. I couldn't find one with her watering tomato plants. But what do you think about that? I mean, it, it is true, isn't it, that if the queen had watered my tomato plants, they wouldn't have died. And it's also true that if I had watered them, they wouldn't have died. But if the queen had watered them, given that I didn't, they wouldn't have died. So is the queen the cause of the death of my tomato plants? Well, yes, but that's true, isn't it? If the Queen had watered them, they wouldn't have died. Yes, you could, you could substitute anyone else in there. Anyway, <laughs> we won't worry about that now because we will look at that later. Um, but that's the sort of um, thought experiment that we might go into to say, well, OK, if that's true and that's true, then isn't that true? And if it isn't true, and none of us think it's true, why isn't it true? What's the difference between the Queen's failing to water my tomato plants and my failing to water them? Or perhaps the, the neighbourhood promised to water them or something like that. Um, oops, are we going around? So, in analysing our concept of causation, we hope to do one of three things. Um, so, we either hope to reduce causation to non-causal relations and matters of fact. So, we hope to understand causation by... Um, cashing it out in terms that we do understand um, that don't appeal to causation, otherwise we'd have something circular. Um, or we hope to eliminate causation. Um, maybe causation doesn't really exist, but there's some other relation um, that, that does the job that we think is causation. Or uh, we might want to admit that causation is primitive. Uh, in other words, that it can't be reduced and it can't be eliminated. Causation is part of the furniture of the universe. It, 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 it is sui generis. It exists in and of itself. And for, uh, for example, can you think of anything else that might be of that kind? Truth is maybe sui generis. Um, 
But so we do one of these things. We'll either reduce it or we'll eliminate it or we'll admit it as primitive as a result of our conceptual analysis. OK, now let's have a look at how science thinks about causation. Um, and scientists use the concept of causation all the time. They're relying on the concept of causation, but they very rarely think about causation. Um, that's not their job. The sciences that think about causation tend to be the sciences that think about thinking. So um, psychology, for example, um, is very interested in the concept of causation because, I mean, for example, um, do babies have a concept of causation? So you'll have seen some of these videos of babies that, um, you know, you do something and try and work out whether the baby realises that one thing causes another. Um, so psychologists are interested in causation. Um, neuroscientists are interested in causation. They like to know what it is in the brain that realises thoughts about causation. Um, and applied robotics uh, is particularly interested in causation. So there's um, a paper by Judea Pearl on your reading list, uh, which is very interesting. I mean, if you want, um, for instance, if you want a domestic robot or a caring robot, um, then you want it to understand that it, if it leaves the child's skateboard in the middle of the floor, the person it's caring for is likely to um, trip over it or something. So you'll, you want to give the robot some idea of causation. Um, and actually, that's, that's, you'll see if you watch the video by Judea Pearl, that's much easier said than done. Um, so those are the sciences that, that are really concentrating on causation. Um, but of course, it, it's, it does appear in every science. It, how can it not? if it's so central to explanation and prediction. OK, here's a very handsome hat chap, Hume, Scottish philosopher, 1711 to 1776. Uh, and he's the author of the regularity theory. It's Hume's regularity theory that really started off thinking about causation. Um, that, it's not entirely true. I mean, Aristotle thought about causation too, and I've given you references on your handout as, as to who thought about causation before Hume. But Hume really started the modern um, discussion of causation. And it was in this book that he claimed fell stillborn from the press. In other words, nobody was interested in this book. So he wrote this book, which is basically this book um, with a few things added and a few things taken away. Um, and uh, it's in there that he discusses causation. And again, you'll get all the references. And you can also find these texts. All his texts are available freely online. Um, you can look at what he actually said himself. OK. Um, right, we're going to look first at the traditional interpretation of Hume. And you'll see later that it becomes important that there are different interpretations of Hume. Uh, then we're going to look at two key problems for the traditional interpretation of Hume. Uh, and then we're going to look at the solutions to these problems leading to the version of Hume's theory that's used today. So we'll end, as I said before, with the canonical statement of the regularity theory of causation. But before I go on to the traditional interpretation of Hume, any questions about what I've said so far? example you said about in the care home of leaving a skateboard in the middle of the room as a potential cause or a potential effect. You have not mentioned the probability at all, but that is there is, it's, there is a probability it has an effect, but no certainty. Well, as, you, as you'll see, that we, probability does become important later. Um, causation could be either always deterministic or it could be sometimes deterministic, sometimes probabilistic, or always probabilistic. Um, there are those three possibilities. Um, and there are philosophers who, who adopt each of those views. Um, you're going to see that it's actually less important than you might think, because although um, the traditional interpretation of Hume treats it as deterministic, because in those days they did, um, you'll see that there is a probabilistic version um, and ditto for every other theory of causation that we're going to be looking at. So A causes B might be um, A necessitates B, 
if determinism is true, or A makes B more probable if causation is probabilistic. Okay, any other? David. Uh, if A causes B, then if, if an A occurs, then a B will occur. Yes, that's the, with some probability. Yes, but if a, B, if a B occurs, and let's say it's not necessary for an A to... No, because if A causes B, it doesn't necessarily mean that A is the only cause of B. So there might be a B without an A if A causes B, but there won't be an A without a B. Did I say that the right way around? I could suddenly hear myself getting confused there, but okay. I just wondered whether you make any distinction, which is linked maybe more, more in psychology between causation and causality. Causality being the sort of more, I mean, the, the ability of the human mind to connect to things. I mean, basically, no. Do you make any or not? no, no. Causality, causation, they use pretty much interchangeably. Um, I'm sure I could think of a, a distinction if you really want me to, but. I don't think I want to. Uh, in your possible uh, versions of what we might mean by understanding causation, the one thing which seems to be missing is the possibility that there is no such unified concept of causation. That in fact, it's a bundle of different things which we habitually lump together. Yes, OK. So, so I said that in analysing the concept of causation, we hope, hope either to reduce it or to eliminate it or to... Um, Make it primitive. Um, yes, I suppose there is a fourth. The fourth one is that what we show is that there's, there's, there are different relations of causation, that it's not a univocal relationship, that there are, there are different types of causation. So, yes, um, yes, if that's a fourth, then there is a fourth. OK, um, let's move on. Let's go on to the traditional interpretation of Hume. OK. There is... Uh, I don't usually believe in putting lots of words up on uh, um, a screen, but, but have, a no have a look at that, because that's the quotation that starts it all. OK, so that's what Hume says about causation, but how should we understand that? Well, let's look at Hume's negative argument to start off with. We'll look at what he thinks causation isn't, um, and then we'll have a look at what he thinks causation is. So Hume's negative argument, the first premise is, our idea of causation seems to be the idea of necessary connection. So if we think that A causes B, well, you've already mentioned probabilism, um, but, but in fact that we tend to think that if A causes B, then A is sufficient for B, i.e. if an A happens, then a B will happen. Um, so that was the start of Hume's argument, and we'll have a look later. Um, I've got a little uh, sort of movie that um, will show you more about what that means. Premise two is, and this is an important premise, as empiricists, we should accept that all our ideas come from impressions. Um, and again, I'll explain this more later. Um, but the, an idea is a concept. A concept is a constituent of thought. So if you're thinking Marianne's wearing blue, you're entertaining your concept of blue. Now I want you to imagine that this is yellow. OK, you doing that? or you're entertaining your concept of yellow at that point. Uh, and you must be entertaining your concept because it's not yellow, is it? Um, so, so you're thinking about this. You're not seeing that the shirt is yellow. You're, you're imagining that the shirt is yellow. Um, but on the other hand, you can see that it's blue. So they, you have a perception of my shirt, and you also have a thought about my shirt. Uh, and one of them entertain, uses an impression, you see that it's blue, and the other one uses a, a, an idea, you imagine that it's yellow. Um, so, for example, um, you're all thinking about elephants right now, 
Um, but there isn't an elephant anywhere near this room that I know of, and even if there is, you can't see it. Um, and so you, you're entertaining your concept of elephant, but not your percept of elephant. For that, you'd have to go to a zoo. Um, OK, so I'll say something more about that later on. And premise three um, says Hume, we do not and cannot, he says, have any experience of necessary connection. Um, so experience and impressions go together. Because when we're having an experience, we're, we're having impressions of something. Um, so his conclusion is our idea of causation is not an idea of necessary connection. And I think you'll agree that that argument is, is a good argument. Uh, the conclusion follows from the premises. And so if the premises are true, then the conclusion will also be true. Is everyone happy with that? Does anyone want to, I'm, as I say, I'm going to say more about this later, but does anyone want to ask anything about that as it stands? I'm struggling, as usual, with trying to relate this to the standard scientific view of evolution of a system. Well, can we leave that to, because that's a substantive question rather than a question of clarification. Okay. Um, so... That's Hume's negative argument. Now, let's have a look at premise two. So premise two, I forgot what premise two was. What's premise two? Uh, as empiricists, we should accept that all our ideas come from impressions. OK, well, Hume's theory of ideas. Um, let's have a look at that, because that's absolutely crucial to his theory of causation. Hume is an empiricist. Uh, I mentioned Kant earlier. Kant isn't an empiricist. Kant is a nativist. Kant thinks that we have innate ideas. We're born with our minds already stocked with certain concepts. Um, Hume and Locke and Berkeley, the three British empiricists, all believed that we are born tabula rasa, as, Hume, as Locke put it. Um, so we're born with our minds as blank slates. We have nothing in our minds when we're born. Instead, we acquire all our thoughts and all our ideas from experience. Um, and people have a great tendency these days to be empiricists because they tend to think that that's the scientifically um, respectable thing to be. Um, but we're going to leave that open. But Hume was definitely an empiricist. So that's an impression, let's pretend. OK, so, so you're experiencing a cat, a very handsome ginger cat. Um, and as a result of experiencing things like that, uh, and black ones and ginger ones and three-legged ones and tailless ones and female ones and male ones and so on, you form an idea of a cat. OK, so you have a percept and this enables you to form a concept. Um, and this, hang on, I've got to... Sorry, this is me trying to be clever here. If it's going to work. No, it's not going to work. Damn. If I could play that, it would meow. <laughs> because I want you to, to understand that um, ideas are not always visual. A lot of your, I mean, your idea of a carburetor isn't visual or auditory, is it? Um, on your idea of feminism or, or um, austerity. None of those things are uh, ideas that come directly from impressions. Um, but the, if you're going to have a, an idea of a cat, it's got to be an idea of something that, that could be ginger or black or da-da-da-da, but also makes a certain sound. And unfortunately, I can't play you the sound it would make. OK, um, so... That's, that's his theory of ideas. Any questions about that before we move on? Because that's a, a crucial element. No? Um, does Hume specify any sort of medium through which the idea manifests itself? Can it be just, just, is it just a picture or could it be all sorts of... Um, oh, it, no, it needn't be a picture at all. I, I, I mean, uh, Locke thought it was a picture, um, but Hume did. I don't think Hume specified. I might be wrong about that, but but it's certainly the case that these days we would say it's not necessary for it to be a picture. Uh, I mean, you might or might not 
have a picture of what feminism means or what austerity means. Um, and if you have a picture, I bet yours is different. Um, and yet the two of you mean the same thing by austerity, let's say, but the pictures you associate with it, if you do associate any with it, might be different. Can you have something totally abstract, say something that's informed by equations, for instance, or scientific... Yes, or love. Love's pretty abstract. Uh, or justice. Um, so a uh, Hume would have to say that you acquire the idea of justice by seeing instances of justice. So uh, when a mother is fair to her children, for example, you see her being just. Uh, when a teacher is fair to the pupils, you see the teacher being just. And through experiences of justice like that, you form your idea of justice. Um, well, string theory is not, not an idea, it's a multitude of ideas, isn't it? I mean, it's a theory. <laughs> string theory. Um, a theory is, is a, a, if you like, a web of beliefs that go together in a coherent whole. Or co maybe a coherent whole. Some people would question that. but uh, so, so a theory is a multitude of beliefs and each belief has a content that's made up of concepts and an idea is a concept. So an idea is a constituent of a thought. So every thought has content and every content will be made up of concepts. Uh, and string theory is made up of beliefs, multitude of beliefs. Each belief has a content and each content is made up of concepts. OK, so now we're going to look at uh, his empiricism, the idea of causation. OK, now here's a billiard ball. OK, and this billiard ball ah, um, is going to go off when the first one hits it. Um, but what, what makes us think that it's going to do that? Because it could be that it does that, couldn't it? I mean, why would you expect, because I bet you do expect, the first thing to happen rather than the second thing to happen? Is there a necessary connection? Could it do the second thing or not? It could. It could, okay. It, so there's absolutely nothing necessary about the fact that the second ball will roll off when the first ball hits it, as opposed to turning purple and doing a little spirit pirouette. Uh, and that's what Hume notices. And he's actually very, because if we think that causation is necessary connection, then we're saying that when the billiard ball hits, when the first billiard ball hits the second billiard ball, it's necessary that the second billiard ball rolls off. But Hume was the first one to notice that there's nothing necessary about it. It's certainly not logically necessary. Um, we can imagine, I mean, there are logically necessary things, for example, um, uh, a bachelor is an unmarried man. Uh, John is a bachelor. Therefore, John is an unmarried man. Yeah, I mean, there's a logical necessity. These two sentences entail the conclusion. And entailment is the relation of logical necessity. Well, there's no logical necessity that when this billiard ball comes in and hits the other, that the other will roll off in the opposite direction. There's nothing logically necessary about that. You can imagine it doing all sorts of things, like spinning, turning purple and spinning off. Um, so if we're going to say that there is necessity of any kind, we've got to introduce a new notion of necessity. We've got to talk about metaphysical necessity. Uh, or we've got to talk about empirical necessity or something like that. We've got to introduce a new concept, if you like. Um, but Hume says, but how do we experience something necessary? And think about that for a second. If something's necessary, it must happen. OK, every time one billiard ball hits another, the billiard ball will roll off. It must happen. It's not just does happen that way. It must happen that way. Could you experience that? That must. Do you think? Yeah, if you give yourself, it will go. 
But must that happen? What if you've been given anaesthetic? Well, obviously there are some limiting conditions, but for most purposes it will happen, yes. For most purposes it will hurt, it yes, fine. But we're talking about it must hurt. There's nothing necessary about it, is there? That, that's the thing that we're thinking. No, uh, OK, um, so in the same way, if I strike a match, it'll only light if there's oxygen around. Um, so there's got to be all sorts of... OK, we're going to be looking at this in some detail later on. Um, but, but at the moment, what I want to get at is the idea, the, the fact that we cannot experience something necessary, something that must be the case or that can't be the case. We can experience that something isn't the case, or that it's not often the case, or that it's nearly always not the case, we can't experience that it cannot be the case. So if, if I use possible world talks, talk just for a moment, to say that something must be the case, to say that two plus two equals four, and that that's a necessary condition, I'm saying that there is no possible world in which two plus two don't equal four. Okay, I can do it in this case because that's a logical necessity. Uh -huh. No, 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 I don't have to specify that because two has a normal meaning in English and so does plus and so does equals and so does four. And so it's only because you're requiring, you're being clever and thinking if I, if I interpret it differently, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, there is a possible world in which two plus two equals four. But I, I'm assuming that you're not interpreting it differently. Um, Oh, thank you. You, uh, you, you under, undermined your, what you said by adding in a physical world, in a f world like this, etc. Um, I mean, if there are worlds in which the second law of thermodynamics doesn't hold, and might there be? I have to say yes, there might be. Then, then I might rest my case again. Necessity is a very strong relationship. If something is necessary, there is no possible world in which it doesn't happen. And if something is, is possible, there is one possible world in which there is at least one possible world in which it does happen. So could we experience necessity? Answer, no because we would have to experience every single possible world, and we couldn't do that. Um, so Hume has a real problem with the idea of necessity. You cannot experience necessity. So as, as logicians, we can believe that something is necessary, but the idea that you could experience it is a very different claim. So where do we get this idea of necessary connection or, or where do we think we get it from? OK, let's... Um oh, it's not working as well as I thought. In fact, it's not working at all. <laughs> Sod. <laughs> It worked on my home computer. OK, what, um, what he thinks that we get our idea of necessary connection from is constant conjunction. Um, so we see one billiard ball hitting another and the other rolling off. And we see one billiard ball hitting another and the other rolling off. And we see one billiard ball hitting another and the other rolling off. And we see this often enough that we start to expect it. And it's that expectation that gives us the idea of necessary connection. So. Um, OK, if our idea, is, uh, idea of causation is not an idea of necessary connection, what is it an idea of? And secondly, why are we so certain that our idea of causation is an idea of necessary connection? OK, I've, I've sort of answered that, but uh, let's, let's go on. OK, so can you see that his negative argument, this is what causation isn't. We think 
that causation is the idea of necessary connection. If it is the idea of necessary connection, this must have come from experience because all our ideas come from experience. Um, but we can't experience necessity. Therefore, it can't be the idea of necessary connection. So that's negative argument. I've seen you, but uh, I'd like to continue just for a minute. The negative argument leaves us with two questions. If Hume is right, if Hume's negative argument is right, that the idea of causation is not an idea of necessary connection, then we're left thinking, well, what is it then? Uh, wh what is this idea of causation that's so important? And we, we'd also like to ask, well, given that we think it is necessary connection, why are we so sure of that when you've just shown us, Hume, if you have shown us, that it can't be? Um, so those are the two questions. So his answer to question one is that our idea of causation is, and wait for it because this is the regularity theory, temporal priority, so the cause comes before the effect, okay, it's spatial contiguity, the cause and the effect are spatially contiguous, and if they appear not to be, there's something in between that makes them, there's no action at a distance, says, cause, uh, says Hume. And finally, it's constant conjunction. When we see A and B constantly conjoined, we start to think that A causes B. So the correlation between A and B causes us to expect B when we see an A, and that expectation is projected by us onto the world and becomes the idea of causation. So Hume thinks there is no more to our idea of causation than these three things. Now that should be making you feel quite uncomfortable, um, but I'm not going to take any questions just at the moment. I'd like to just go on a little bit more. Okay, this is the regularity theory of causation. There's no more to causation than these three things. And Hume's answer to question two is, it is just habit. It's because we see A and B correlated and we form the expectation of seeing a B whenever we see an A, that we think that A and B are causally um, related. And it's that expectation that we spread on the world, that we project onto the world um, and call necessary connection. But in fact, there is no necessary connection. All there is is a habit of mind. So in a way, uh, Hume is saying, if you're saying that causation is necessary connection, then Hume is saying there isn't any causation. But actually what he's saying is not that um, causation is necessary connection and there isn't any. He's saying causation isn't necessary connection at all. Causation is just temporal priority, spatial contiguity and constant conjunction. Hence the regularity theory and regularities. Okay, let me see where I am because... Uh, Okay, um, the key characteristics of the regularity theory of causation are, firstly, it's reductive. Okay, so do you remember I said that what we hope to do as a result of um, conceptual analysis is either to reduce or to eliminate or to make primitive? RTC is reductive. He's reducing the idea of causation to temporal priority, spatial contiguity, and constant conjunction. Um, so it reduces causation to regularity, and it prioritises causal regularities over singular causal relations. If you only ever see one billiard ball hitting another and the other rolling off once, you'll never think that the first caused the second says Hume. Actually, you would because you've seen so many other similar things. But if you only see one case, there can't be causation, according to Hume, in the individual case. Now, many philosophers have, have quarrelled about that, um, but that's what Hume thinks. He reduces causation to regularity. Um, he also uh, is a realist. So the regularity theory of causation is a realist theory about causation. Causation really exists. And that's because there really are regularities. 
Um, there really are correlations between events, and, and that's what causation is. So there is something that satisfies the conditions that it would have to satisfy if causation were to exist. Um, so regularities are real and they're mind independent. Even if we weren't here to see these correlations, they would be there. So causation is realist, realistic. And finally, um, regularity theory of causation is austere. And what I mean by that is Hume really is saying there's no explanation, there's no relation that is this constant conjunction, uh, sorry, that underpins the constant conjunction or the regularities. All there is, is the regularities. So if a scientist is trying to find out whether A causes B, he sees the constant conjunction between A and B and he sees, yes, A causes B, but how, what explains that? He'll look, and if he's lucky, he'll find a deeper correlation. Okay, so, so C causes A and D causes B, and that's why A and B are con conjoined, because C and D are conjoined. And then if he looks a bit harder, he might look a bit, and he'll find another correlation, and another correlation. And Hume will think that's all he'll ever find, all the way down. Um, so it's correlation all the way. There is no such thing as a metaphysically necessary connection that explains these constant conjunctions. And if that's making you very uncomfortable, don't worry, you're not alone. Um, so it eliminates the idea of necessary connection. It, it says you want this idea of there being a metaphysical necessity there. Okay, well you recognise it's not a logical necessity, but you want to introduce this idea of a metaphysical necessity, but you shouldn't because it, we can explain everything to do with causation without appealing to necessary connection. Therefore, necessary connection is redundant, we don't need it, uh, and we should be austere in our theories of causation. So, okay, well, before I look at the problems that everyone else has thought, what are the problems that you think? What, is there anything you don't like about this theory? Mike. It's not so much problem with the theory, but I can't see the point of the temporal aspect of the theory. Or others will more precise, the temporal aspect of the theory does not seem to agree at all with the example of colliding billiard balls. Uh, you might as well say that ball A stopped moving because ball B started moving. The actual interaction is a point interaction which is non-temporal, at least in... in OK, well, it's interesting that you went for that one first. I mean, it's certainly true that, that Hume's theory makes temporal priority of the cause over the effect um, a, an analytical condition of causation. And we might say, well, is that true? I mean, could it not be that the, the effect comes before the cause? Couldn't there be backwards causation? And lots of philosophers have looked at the possibility of backwards causation. Um, and, but Hume doesn't. I mean, that's one thing he... D that's actually probably the least examined from, by Hume uh, of his theory. He just assumes that causes come before effects. And actually, so do most of us most of the time. Um, so if we see a correlation, it's the... the prior event that we think of as the cause and the second event that we think of as the effect. Isn't there also justification to talk about... Oh, sorry, there are two people talking. Uh, sorry, David, I was talking to the gentleman further back, just to start with. Um, well, that's a bit unfair. I mean, the question was, does Hume justify his use of the concept of necessity because he doesn't seem to have access to the concept of necessity? Um, what he thinks is that the knee-jerk concept of causation is that of necessary connection. And he claims to have shown that it's not necessary connection. So I don't think it's Hume who needs to justify his use of the concept of necessity. It's everybody else. Um, but should, I mean, according to you, that, that concept shouldn't really have ever come into being because nobody... 
Well, no, because logical necessity is permitted. I mean, we all understand logical necessity, and we, we logical necessity is, is explicable in the in the reasoning that we do. Um, but what he's questioning is is whether there's this second sort of necessity, namely metaphysical or empirical necessity. And he's the one who shows that everyone assumes that, but actually, we don't need to, or so he says. David. When we talk about a cause, most things that we can think of have multiple causes or multiple factors that in themselves are insufficient. Does the theory take account of that? Well, uh, we'll look at that in more depth later. That's the same question as the one that came earlier. And when, so when you strike a match, the striking of the match causes the lighting of the match. Well, it wouldn't if there weren't any oxygen in the room. Um, so, so the striking of the match can't be a sufficient condition for the lighting of the match. You've got to take into account other things. So we'll have a look at that in a minute. Okay? Well, I'm struggling a bit with Speak up. necessary connection. Um, and we cannot experience that something must happen, as you said, because sometimes we can't observe all instances. We may be unconscious. Mm -hmm. But then we can't observe all... all well, we may be dead. Well, no, we can see a constant conjunction because a constant conjunction doesn't necessarily mean an exceptionless conjunction, uh, nor does it necessarily mean a conjunction that goes on forever and a day. It just means if I see A's causing B's, I, I, think for a second about the concept of causation. Um, if you're going to claim A causes B, um, firstly, what's your evidence? Secondly, um, what would falsify it? Um, well, perhaps we'll just stick with those two at the moment. So if we're going to say that, uh, make a claim like A causes B, what's going to be your evidence for this? Of what? I mean, you're directly perceiving me, but that doesn't give you evidence that A causes B. No, like in Michotte's experiment, where people were directly given certain events to observe, and they directly perceived causal relations. Okay, and what is it they... Well, you're thinking of Michotte, uh, and that is a particular um, case. C can we go back to the everyday thought of causation? So. When people are uh, doing the psychological experiment with the children, seeing whether children have the idea of causation, what do they tend to show children in the hope that they form the belief A causes B? Light switch and the light on. Yes, OK. So you switch the switch and the light goes on. You switch the switch the other way and the light goes off. You switch it that way and the light goes on. You switch it that way and the light goes off, and so on. And the child will very quickly pick up what to do. So what you're doing is you're showing a constant conjunction, aren't you? You're showing that putting the switch that way turns the light on, and putting the switch that way turns the light off. Um, so the evidence for causation is always going to be a correlation or a constant conjunction. Um, so Hume is certainly right from that point of view. Um, we, we don't have evidence for causation other than correlations or constant conjunctions. And what would falsify the claim that A causes B? What, what would you make you think it's not true that A causes B? Just one case so you see an A and not a B. So you break the constant conjunction, you break the correlation. If you think that A causes B and you see an A without a B, you know you've got something wrong. So, um, OK, it's not true that A causes B deterministically. Um, you might think, OK, so you see C, A and not B. So um, you know that it's not the case a causes B. There's something wrong with that. Maybe it's only a certain type of A's that cause B's. Maybe it's only A stars 
cause Bs. So you, when this A that you saw that isn't followed by a B actually isn't an A star. Or maybe this is a case of probabilistic causation. Maybe A does cause B, but not deterministically, only with a certain probability. So there will be exceptions to the constant conjunction. Um, it'll be only certain constant to a certain extent. So do you see the, the correlation constant conjunction is, is absolutely central to our idea of causation. But Hume, of course, is claiming that it, that's all there is. There is no more to causation than constant conjunction. And that's quite counterintuitive. I remember when I first understood this theory as an undergraduate, I, I just thought, it, how could it possibly be the case? How could somebody really think that? Um, and you might be thinking the same thing and thinking that you've misunderstood the theory, but you haven't. The theory really is that there is no more to causation than constant conjunction. How about tuberculosis being caused by the acid pass bacillus? You don't get tuberculosis without it. So is that a necessary cause? Um, so you're saying that... that uh, whatever it is, is necessary for tuberculosis. Yes. Uh, okay, but it must also be sufficient for it to be a... We usually think of a, a cause being sufficient rather than being necessary. Um, but it's sufficient in that it necessitates it. Let, let's go on to look at... Oh, okay, I'll take two more quite quickly and then I'll go on to look at the problems. What were you going to say? Well, it's not just Hume, it's also the rest of us, because all of us take constant conjunction as evidence for causation. But some of us are more inductively bold than others of us. And those of us who are inductively bold may take just two uh, cases and then extrapolate from there. Others of us will want to say, well, hang on, I've only seen two. I want to see a few more. Um, and so on. So, so it depends how inductively bold you are as to how... Um, so one more down here. Sorry, I, I will take questions later, but one more. At the Logically, the disproof of A causes B by a single observation is, of course, correct. But it relies on our absolute knowledge of what exactly A and B are. And in practice, in science in particular, it doesn't work like that. You can have experiment which quite obviously denies Yes, I, absolutely. Yeah, if, we, if we've seen A and causing B, if we've seen A and B in constant conjunction forever and ever and always, and everyone else we've ever spoken to has seen, and then we see an A without a B, we're much more likely to think that we can't believe our eyes. Because a miracle is like that, isn't it? A miracle is an exception to the laws of nature. And you don't make something a law of nature unless you've seen it happen very, very often. Um, so the idea that you can s say there's been an exception to it just because you think you've seen an exception on one occasion is a big problem. Hume is very good on miracles because he thinks that epistemologically speaking you can never justify the claim that there's been a miracle because a miracle is an exception to a law of nature and the, the, epistemolo the evidence that we need to make something a law of nature could never be undermined by one experience of a, of a contrary case. Um, but we can talk about that more in the question time, if you like. Let's have a look at the problems that philosophers have found for this. Um, OK, one uh, problem might be the whole thing relies on Hume's empiricism. Um, Hume thinks that the idea of causation must come from experience and that the idea of necessary connection cannot come from experience, so the idea of causation cannot be necessary connection. Um, but that relies on this empiricist idea. And if you're Kant, you say, well, sod that. <laughs> Let's throw empiricism out. Let's say that we're born with the idea of causation, and then we can say that the idea of causation is the idea of necessary connection. We don't need to be empiricists. So we can reject Hume's 
bedrock theory, which is his theory of ideas, his empiricism. Um, we don't have to accept that. We, we can easily accept uh, another theory. Um, there are other people who think, uh, well, who might ask, is there really no impression from which we might get our idea of necessary connection? So you mentioned Michotte. Uh, Michot is, is a psychologist, I think, um, who tried to show that we do see causation in the individual case. And he, uh, well, actually, there have been other philosophers. So when you cut a slice of bread, says uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, when you're slicing the loaf of bread, can't you feel that you are causing the bread as you push the knife through the bread? Isn't, isn't that causation something you're experiencing directly, that this is a necessary connection, that the bread could not not be cut as you slice it? Um, and Davidson also thinks that we see causation in the individual case. So Hume, um, do you remember I said uh, the regularity theory, he thinks that causal regularities are prior to the causa causation in the individual case. Well, we can reject that. We can say that's not true. We do see causation in the individual case. When we see one billiard ball hitting another, we actually see a case of causation. And we call that necessary connection. Um, so we can reject that. Um, we can say that correlations don't have a direction. I mean, this is what, um, well, we're talking about spatial contiguity or temporal priority. Um, if we see A and B constantly conjoined, um, there isn't, we, uh, then the correlation doesn't have a direction, does it? If A is correlated with B, then B is correlated with A. What makes us think that A causes B rather than the other way around? This is the point that Mike was making. A minute ago. Um, we might also ask, how can a relation that depends on similarity be objective? So do you remember that quotation I gave you um, from a causes? Um, let's see if I can, if I've got it written here. No, I haven't. Um, he talks about uh, a cause is where you see one event and another event and then similar events in the same constant conjunction. So you've got to notice that the, relation, that the events that are correlated are similar to each other. So A causes B, A causes B, A causes B, A and B are in constant correlation. You've got to have the idea of the similarity between the A's and the similarity between the B. And the idea of similarity is a very human-centred um, concept, isn't it? So we think of causation as objective, but how can it be object objective if that's what we're talking about, if we rely on similarity? And the last two um, objections are, are absolutely key. Surely regularity isn't sufficient for causation. Um, surely with there are regularities that are not causal. Um, so if, a pine if every time a pineapple has dropped from a tree, Marianne's coughed, is that a causal regularity or is it just a coincidence? And if it's just a coincidence, and, and we can imagine, I mean, imagine in this room, every male in this room is a second son. OK, that, could, that is possible. It could be the case that just by coincidence, every male in this room is a second son. Would you think it's causal because there's a correlation between being a male in this audience and being a second son? Answer, no. It's, it's surely a coincidence. So if, if there can be regularities that are not sufficient for causation, then how can causation be regularity? It can't be. And it gets worse. Surely regularity is not necessary for causation. The Big Bang caused the universe. Well, there, that only happened once, didn't it? And if it did only happen once, well, OK. Oh, God, multiverse. <laughs> um, but uh, if you think that causation can happen in the individual case, then regularity isn't necessary for causation and it's also not sufficient. So 
over the years since Hume developed his regularity theory, there have been hundreds of objections to it, and, and I've just given you a selection here, and these have been discussed ad nauseum. Um, but we're going to look at... Ooh! <laughs> that one and that one. <laughs> As you see, I've spent my summer learning PowerPoint. <laughs> OK, so let's, let's have a look at the claim that regularities are not sufficient for causation. OK, if every male in this audience is a second son, that's not enough to make it, it... I mean, are they... Were they caused to be a second son by being in this audience? Or is there being a second son causing them to be in this audience? Uh, no, <laughs> is the answer to that. Um, well, what about the barometer falling every time a storm is about to start? Well, there's a, there's a correlation, isn't there? So does the falling of the barometer cause the storm to start? Does the storm starting cause the barometer to fall? Not really, no, it goes via... I mean, what you've got is a drop in the atmospheric pressure. Is it a drop in the atmospheric pressure? It causes both the storm to start and the barometer to fall. So you've got one thing, so you've got a, a something like this, a structure like this. Um, a and B are correlated, but that's because both are caused by C. So this, this relation is a correlation, but not a cause. This is a cause, and this is a cause, but this isn't. Do you see? So a correlation cannot be sufficient. For, for a causation, can it? So Hume's got to be wrong, surely. Um, so sometimes co uh, correlations are coincidental, uh, and sometimes coincidences, uh, correlations come about because they are both the result of a, of a common cause. So how, before Hume's theory can really be taken seriously, we've got to exclude accidental generalizations and other non-causal regularities from the regularity theory of, causa of causation. Do you see that? Um, OK, what about the claim that regularities are not necessary for causation? Well, some smokers don't get cancer. You know, we say that smoking causes cancer, but everyone can tell the story of my dad uh, which is that he didn't die till 84 and yet he smoked 60 cigarettes a day since he was 16. Um, and I mentioned the existence of the universe was brought about by a big bang. There seem to be at least, there are exceptions, sorry, there are causation, correlations to which there are exceptions that we think of as causation. And also we looked a minute ago, do we not observe causation in the individual case? And so we've got to include this type of non-regular causation in our account of causation. And how can Hume do that if he says that causation is regularity? OK, so the solution... OK, so, so ooh, what have I done? So going back to problem one, regularities are not sufficient for causation. How does Hume uh, account for that? OK, so he appeals to the... Well, he doesn't. We appeal on his behalf to the laws of nature to distinguish between those regularities that are causal and those that aren't. Um, so no law of nature ensures that any male in this audience is a second son. Um, but there is a law that underpins the fact that every child born with Down syndrome has trisomy 21, has a third or a partial third copy of um, chromosome 21. Uh, so it's by appeal to the laws of nature that we say, actually, it's only regularities that are underpinned by the laws of nature. Now, if you're thinking, what's a law of nature? That's good. Um, the laws of nature also underpin relations between fall in atmospheric pressure and a falling barometer and between the, the uh, fall in atmospheric pressure and the onset of the storm. No separate law relates these two. 
So in order for a, relation to, uh, for a correlation to be a causal correlation, it's got to be underpinned by a law of nature. That's what, so we can distinguish between accidental correlations and causal correlations, and we can get rid of the first really quite serious problem for Hume's theory. Um, so it's only regularities underpinned by a law of nature that are causal. And for the second problem, the one that says that, that uh, regularity isn't necessary for causation, we can s insist that it only appears to be the case that there's causation without regularity. So Mill says, and, and a couple of you have already given voice to this objection, whatever we identify as the cause of a given effect is in fact only part of the cause. So when we say that the match uh, lit because it was struck, um, and you rightly point out that actually it wouldn't have lit even though it was struck if there was no oxygen around, Mill says, quite right, um, the striking of the match was only part of the cause and oxygen was another part of the cause. Another part of the cause was how hard you struck the match and, and so on. So everything that's needed to make the cause sufficient for the effect has got to be in there as part of the cause. Um, so we're, we're partially uh, describing the cause. So we pick out something as the cause when actually it isn't the cause, it's just part of the cause. And Davidson, uh, Donald Davidson says, whenever we observe a case of causation, we always believe that there is a law, but we don't know what that law is. So we see one thing um, causing another. We see causation in the individual case. And we think that if A... So you see an individual case of A causing B. Um, but that makes you think that there is a law that somehow means that A was sufficient for B. There's some law that underpins that happening. If A did cause B, then there's some law of nature that makes it the case that if you were to repeat that A exactly, and the same, exactly the same circumstances, you would again get a B. Um, that's what causation is. So we see causation in an individual case or in a few cases and then later through observation and experiment, i.e. science, will discover a regularity. If it's true that A causes B, then if we look hard enough, we will find that there's a regularity um, underpinning that, a law of nature underpinning of it. Okay, now how are we doing time-wise? Okay, now John Mackey argued that individual causes must be at least innus conditions for their effects. Okay, a cause is an innus condition if and only if. That's not a misprint, it means if and only if. The former, i.e. the cause, is an insufficient but necessary part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition of the effect. Now, if you think about, again, the, the, um, or think of a short circuit causing a fire, which is the one that he was using. Um, okay, the short circuit was not uh, sufficient for the fire, because there also had to be the flammable material that was sitting around it and the oxygen in the air and things like that. Okay, so the short circuit was insufficient, but it was necessary in that had the short circuit not occurred, the fire would not have occurred. OK, uh, but it was an unnecessary but sufficient condition. It was, uh, sorry, insufficient but necessary, part of, OK. So the short circuit was part of a set of conditions um, that were not themselves necessary because the fire might have started for other reasons, but that were, in fact, sufficient for the effect. Can you see how this would work out? I mean, it's very complicated trying to put it like that, but if you work through this yourself, so you say a short circuit caused a fire um, and you can work out why the short circuit is insufficient but necessary, part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition of the fire. Um, we can talk about that in a minute. So, um, 
this is the canonical statement of RTC as used today. C is a cause of E if and only if for some time earlier than E, notice we're getting the temporal priority in there, causes come before their effects, C belongs to a set of events that occurred at T um, that none redundantly suffices for E. In other words, it is sufficient for the effect um, and what's more, it was necessary for the effect. And that is a cause according to the regularity theory of causation. And next week we're going to look at a completely different theory of causation that was for years considered to be a rival to the RTC. So a lot of people didn't like the RTC but this one came along instead and what a relief, it's so much better or so we thought. Okay, I'm going to stop there and let's um, see if we can make sense of that. Okay, is that thoroughly bamboozled you? Mm. Yes, that, that would be good, actually. Douglas is going to go around with a, with a microphone, if we can find the... Um, well, actually, there isn't a mic here. Don't worry. Uh, people asking questions just have to shout. Uh, we'll do that at the end. Um, so, just to recap, what we've done is we've looked at what the causation is a concept that we have that is absolutely central to our ability to explain, predict or manipulate the world. Um, so it's quite important. What is this causation? What is this causal relation? Um, Hume comes along and says, well, OK, if we look at the way we use the notion of causation in ordinary language, we treat it as the concept of necessary connection. So if A causes B, then A is sufficient for B, it necessitates B. Um, and then Hume says, but it can't be, because we must experience necessity in order to have this idea of metaphysical necessity. Well, if it can't be, what is causation? And he looks at the uh, evidence for causation and, and what we think of, and points out that actually it's only constant conjunction or correlation that we ever use and we could ever use as evidence for causation. And he thinks there is no more to causation than correlation, no more than constant conjunction. There's no metaphysical underpinning of that constant cause, uh, uh, constant conjunction. Okay, let's, let's have a few questions. Uh, yeah, I'd like to go back to your last slide, the last statement, and I wonder if you could just explain non redundancy Um, that one. Yeah, could you just comment that again? Yeah, let's, uh, let's use it again with the short circuit. Um, so there's a fire in a warehouse and the, um, where's my pen? And the fireman comes in and he says the short circuit caused the fire. Okay, we, we can all, that makes sense to us, we, we'd accept that, especially as the fireman said it. Um, but the for short circuit um, was, uh, it was not itself sufficient for the fire, okay, it was insufficient for the fire because if there hadn't been that, that flammable material next to it, so that when the short circuit occurred, the flammable material caught fire and, and so on. Okay, so the short circuit caused the fire, but it was not sufficient for the fire, all these other things were needed as well. Um, but it was necessary for the fire. In other words, had the, sh had the short circuit not have occurred, the fire would not have occurred, okay, on this day. So, so the, the reason the fireman is saying the short circuit caused the fire is because it's true, according to the fireman, that had the short circuit not occurred, the fire would not have occurred. Um, so it's necessary, um, but it's a, um, uh, 
hang on, have I got this the right way around? I'm actually going back to this one. Um, insufficient but necessary, part of an unnecessary. Okay, um, the total cause was sufficient. Okay, because if you combine the short circuit occurring when it did, the flammable material beside it, the fact there was oxygen in the air, etc., all of that was sufficient. Um, but the total cause wasn't necessary um, because the fire might have occurred if, if some vandals had got in and started it with a match or something like that. So when the fireman says the short circuit caused the fire, it's shorthand, if you like, for the short circuit was uh, not itself sufficient for the fire, but it was necessary. Um, and the thing that was sufficient for the fire was the totality of conditions that caused the fire, which, of course, were not necessary for the fire because the fire might have started in other ways. OK, so it's all getting very complicated, but it's only when you get all those conditions in. OK, so, so moving, how did that get translated into this? Um, sometime earlier than C. So the short circuit caused the fire. Uh, the fire happened at T, and the short circuit caused at T minus 1. OK, so the short circuit occurred at T minus 1, and the fire occurred at T. Um, so there's a set of events, the total cause, um, that occurred at T that non-redundantly suffices for E. Um, in other words, the short circuit was necessary. It wasn't redundant. Is, is the non-redundantly <coughs> suffices go with C or the set of events when that sentence? Is it C belongs yeah. or the set of events that's non Oh, I see. Um, occurring to see. Yes, it's the set of events that non-redundantly suffices for T. But don't, don't worry too much about this canonical statement. Um, the only re I mean, I used to get very fed up reading Mackey. Um, the only thing that you need to know to remember, really, are these three things. OK, let's make it really easy for you. Quite properly, there's not, I'm not dumbing down. Um, this is going up too far. You don't need it, although I've got to say it. Um, so three things you need. Uh, what are they? What was it? OK, so Hume says that um, causation is regularity and also temporal priority and spatial contiguity. But, but regularity is the important thing. Um, the problem is that um, regularity and no causation and uh, causation and no regularity, okay, that's causation isn't sufficient for regularity and causation isn't necessary for regularity. Sorry, the other way around. So if you're... Uh, insisting that there's an identity between those two things, then it shouldn't be the case that you have, can have one without the other, should it? OK. And so the, the solution um, is uh, regularity and no causation. Uh, the solution is the laws of nature. When you have a regularity that isn't causal, it's because it's a coincidence or something like that. So in order to be causal, it needs to be underpinned by a law of nature. And uh, the other one, uh, you've got to think of total causes and partial causes. So you may think there's causation and no regularity. Um, because the short circuit has occurred. Not every short circuit causes a fire. So why do you think this short circuit causes the fire if there's supposed to be a regularity here? Well, answer, you've got to look at the total cause, the, the whole set of conditions that were sufficient for the effect. Oh, does that help a bit?
surely it's a regular co-occurrence of events that reveal the laws of nature. But if all the men were set in the room, there was what? no point when you go out and look for Excellent. the law that underpins it. You are, you are absolutely right. Um, and I said at the point I introduced it, I said, if you're wondering what a law of nature is, that's a, it's a very good question. So if, if we, um, we're appealing to laws of nature to distinguish uh, causal correlations and non-causal correlations, i.e. accidents or two effects of the same cause or something like that, um, well, then a law of nature ought to be something different from a regularity, oughtn't it? Um, and interestingly, the type of uh, account of law of nature doesn't really distinguish between um, this. What it does is it... Science would come in and say, OK, every male in this room is a second son. Um, is there a causal relationship there? Now, if all they looked at was the correlation between second sons and here, you, you would have to say there is a causal relation. But what um, you would do is you would say, well, OK, if there's a law of nature there, it must be the same outside this room. Um, and so they would try and do it elsewhere. They would try and see. And so actually a law of nature has got to be uh, implicated in our best deductive systems. That's what a law of nature is. So it's a correlation that, that works over and over again in different places of the world, at different times of the world, with different observers, etc. So you picked up a very good point and it's, it's interesting whether it's answered properly by saying that because do you see that there's nothing but correlations there? Yeah. It's just that the correlations have got to work more generally. You don't need any mechanism. Um, uh, once again, you're going back to a Humean idea that there is no more to causation than regularity. But the regularity must be, if you like, scientifically respectable. Um, so science has, has got to establish that it happens more often than just in this room. I mean, that, that every male in this room is the second son could be coincidence. But if every male who ever goes to a lecture anywhere is a second son, that starts to look really quite interesting. <laughs> I mean, you might start thinking of possible explanations for that. But, but if you do find an explanation, it'll be a correlation at a lower level. In the canonical statement, what Speak is up. the... In the canonical statement of uh, regularity theory, what is the earlier time C... Which occurs in the collision of billiard balls? Uh, the first billiard ball hitting the other one, no. and the second one rolling off. Well, no, surely those occur simultaneously. Um, I don't think they do, do they? Well, well there, I mean, there is a question whether there can be... I mean, if Hume is right, there cannot be simultaneous causation, and lots of people have asked you know, why there couldn't be simultaneous causation. Um, well, what I'm really asking is, is this statement modifiable to account possibility of simultaneous causation? Because I can't see that it can be. Um, if and if... Well, you could just say C, uh, C is the cause of E, if and only if C belongs to a set of events that non-redundantly suffices for E. Why, why, you could just take the temple reference out. Because in such a case, you are describing the totality of the situation, in which case cause becomes indistinguishable from the effect. Um, well, you could say that, yeah. Okay. Bob, um, speak up. Did, uh, is it thought that Hume had any answer to the question somebody might have asked him? Uh, what is it that causes the laws of nature to be what they are? Um... Well, um, you, it would be very, I mean, Hume himself didn't talk about laws of nature. It was, it was Mill who introduced laws of nature in explanation of um, regularities that are not causal. Um, so you can't really ask Hume that question. Um, but you could say, well, what is the explanation of this law of nature? Um, and 
you would look further down and all you would find, if Hume is right, is yet another correlation. So you might be able to find an explanation of one correlation in terms of another correlation and you might be able to find an explanation of that lower correlation in terms of lower correlation. But what you will never find, if Hume is right, is, is a relation that isn't just a regularity. So you'll never find a physical relation, for example. Um, so science will never say, ah, this physical relation is the causal relation, because Hume thinks that doesn't make sense. OK, one more, then we'd better finish. Yeah, is Hume actually saying that nothing is absolute, that everything is relative? Uh, no, because, uh, well, that, that statement make, makes... Um, I mean, you can use that in so many different contexts, uh, and, I mean, it could be a moral claim or... or uh, but I don't see why he would be saying that... Everything is observation and impression. Well, he is saying that, that all our ideas come from impressions, but that's not the same as saying that everything is relative, nothing is absolute. Um, I mean, I don't know why you would want to say that in this context. Uh, okay, and you're saying that that means that everything's relative. Everything's relative to a. Okay, if if you want to think of it that way, I would rather not. <laughs> um, but I'm not quite sure how you're understanding it, so I'm not quite sure if if I can if I can say that you're wrong, or indeed that you're right. Okay, let's, let's finish there, and next week I'll look at the counterfactual theory, and you'll find that as we go through, looking at the different theories will give you a better grip on what causation is altogether. I mean, I hope you won't go away from these lectures knowing what causation is, I can tell you that right now, um, but what you'll have is some different ideas of what causation might be and why it matters. <laughs>